Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. We have a special guest. We have Dr. Falgun Chokshi, and he is a physician and a businessman who actually works a lot in uh, venture capital and the like as well. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com. I'm going to let Falgun introduce himself before we talk about our topic today. Falgun? Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me, Darshan. Uh, I was excited about doing this when you uh, uh, invited me. Um, so, uh, you know, hello to all the listeners and viewers. Uh, my name is Falgun Chakshi. I'm actually a physician by trade, uh, but I also uh, do investments, uh, I guess, on the side for now in the biotech and medtech spaces. Um, I do have a very keen interest in uh, the area of space commercialization and seeing how technologies that we have uh, here on Earth can be used uh, for that purpose and then vice versa as well. Uh, I'm particularly interested on in how human um, humans can actually safely go to space and my background in radiology and um, some of the investments that I've done in the biotech space, um, I think it puts, uh, puts me in a pretty interesting position to give some uh, uh, different perspectives. So thanks a lot for having me on. This is going to be really interesting because um, right before we start, we start talking a little bit about um, space health. And that's such a wide topic to most of us. What does space health even mean before we get into like some of the yeah. basics? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's interesting because it's, uh, it's something that, I mean, most people don't obviously think, think of on the day-to-day or the week-to-week. And, uh, but a, a lot of the technologies just in general, even without health, just in general, a lot of the technologies that we use on Earth from – you know, from our smartphones to um, radio, just radial tires to freeze-dried foods and your frozen dinners and all, like, things that are very commonplace in society nowadays. Um, all those technologies actually came from space technologies and space exploration. Uh, NASA has actually made a huge contribution in that front over many decades. And the reason um, space health is an issue is that, uh, you know, people may think that, well, what does that have to do with me on Earth here? Well, the reason it's important is because a lot of the technologies that can be de- developed or have been developed in the setting of medicine and space medicine have um, as particular uses on Earth. So an example is a newer technology would be um, the use of particular types of high-frequency ultrasound to break uh, kidney stones apart without having to do any kind of interventional procedure. And this technique was actually developed uh, in space. And uh, the reason why being when you go to space, we tend to have bone loss. And when that bone loss occurs, our calcium levels in the blood go up. And when they go up, you have a higher chance of forming kidney stones. So the interesting thing is, is that even though the technology was developed out there, its use on Earth, because kidney stones are a very common ailment for a lot of people, it can be used you know, pretty much anywhere on Earth. And it's a very low cost solution, actually. So, you know, space health sounds like a very kind of no pun intended, but like a pie in the sky type of idea. But I think the importance of it is, is that with the, uh, with the advent of lower cost launches being able to be performed by companies like SpaceX, what ends up happening is that now we can actually go out into space in, you know, near, near what's called low earth orbit. And we can commercialize technologies that have uh, both space bound and earthbound applications. Um, And I can discuss some of that with you. Yeah, tell us a little bit about some of the recent space-bound or Earth-bound applications that you're already looking at. Yeah, so uh, it, w- one of the first things that was actually uh, looked into is you know when you uh, is actually in the fiber optics in- industry where fiber op- optic cables can be uh, can we can be developed in a much higher uh, sort of quality and a higher um, um, how would you say a, a better a solid crystalline structure than they can be on Earth. The interesting thing about that is, is that that can be that can be used both uh, in space or space related exploration and also on Earth, such as with the fiber optic cables that run, you know, uh, along the floor of the Atlantic Ocean in order to get us our Internet globally. Um, on the health front, interestingly, uh, pharmaceutical applications are a are an area that's um, that has already received funding in order to be done. So a lot of major pharmaceutical companies have leased time in the International Space Station on the, you know, the, the, the laboratory portion of it in order to see what are the effects of microgravity. And, and the interesting thing is, is that 
even though the laws of physics don't, you know, don't change in our sort of in our macro environment, the effect of gravity is is a very significant force, not just for us as as um, biological, you know, systems, but also for non biological systems, such as, you know, these these uh, fiber optic cables and whatnot. But the cool thing about the in the pharmaceutical industry is that there are certain medications that can be form can be developed higher quality actually in space. And that that technique then, then can be scaled and then the medication can be brought back to Earth. And the interesting thing is, is that the reason why is because you don't have these issues in space that you have on Earth. Namely, let's like, say, you know, heat, um, heat uh, convection currents. You don't have like the effect of gravity, you know, messing up like a layer system uh, where, you know, heavier things will now go to the bottom. And the, inter- and the, and the cool part about that is, is that. It, it, it may sound like, oh, well, this sounds so expensive. You know, this is just this is just going to make the price of you know medications and technologies more expensive. The funny thing is, it, it's actually not as expensive as you would think, and the trade-off for the quality and the efficacy of having these things work is actually pretty high. And and there are companies already working on making factories in space for these kind of things. So as with any industry, once you can once you can reduce the unit cost. Of a particular product, you're through economies of scale and 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 larger manufacturing practices. Now all of a sudden you're able to bring down that cost. So I think what we're going to see over the next probably 10 to 15 years is we're going to see more commercialization funding go into space, and we're going to see that 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 effect of earthbound technologies now you know becoming improved or new or or you know further disseminated. So um, we, we're already getting some interesting comments. Uh, we've got some people talking about better development of pharmaceuticals in space, and they're excited. So that should be really, really exciting. Here, here's a question for you, though. Mm-hmm. We're talking about bringing um, high-frequency ultrasound to from space back to Earth. We're talking about building factories in space. But isn't that a little premature in that do, do we need, for example, IRB approval? to do studies for patients uh, who are in space? Or do we say that that's the practice of medicine and therefore you don't mm-hmm. actually need to get IRB approval? What's your take on that? How has it been handled? Yeah. Where, where... So, you know, so I, I think as with a lot of things in space, it's it's a frontier it's a frontier perspective. Like you're, yeah. you're going into another frontier and you know, the cliche always is, is space is the final frontier. But yeah. in a way it, it is because it is boundless. Like, you know, we. We, we could travel for generations and generations and we would never even get out of our, our, own, our own solar neighborhood, so to speak. So right. what, what I think is that, you know, what historically has happened is essentially these astronauts that have gone up either as part of Russian missions, you know, United States missions and whatnot, they tend, they essentially uh, sign over their consent rights. So they say, okay, we go up there, you, you know, you use our bodies to test us out for different technologies, different methodologies. And what ends up happening is, is that then you get like that proof of concept going. So the ultrasound is a good example. Now, it, now when it comes to like saying that, okay, can we, do we have any kind of indication that let's say the you know, the FDA has to approve or, or that a, a, a governing body has to approve and for that you need a clinical trial. Yes, you can do a clinical trial, uh, but the issue is going to be, um, your sample size, because right now the sample size is pretty small up in space, right? You only have a handful of astronauts there at any given time. You, the lay public, although more people from the general public are being chosen as astronauts, uh, which was, you know, it just happened this year. Um, I, it's not the same thing as what we see in sci- science fiction movies or science fiction shows where you just get on a, a, a ship, a rocket ship or something, and, and you're just taking it just like a bus, like you would take a right. bus from one place to the other. So I feel like there will be a role for IRBs, but I feel also that because space is not any one country's sovereignty, right? It it, it sort of is like well, it depends on who's doing the research. So um, the thing about IRBs is yes, it is good. I think it, it is good to take a step back and know what you're doing, but you don't want the IRB or other regulatory uh, sort of systems to essentially be the bottlenecks which dissuade particular countries. From developing technologies, which then another country with less regulation will just go ahead and do. So I, I think there's going to be have to be a little bit of a change on how the how expeditious IRBs are because they they tend to be very slow in general. They do. But here's the question then: 
do we mm. land up in a scenario where we say we'd rather be fast and nimble, but potentially unsafe, than be uh, slow and uh, constructive, but safer? And that's the balance that hopefully IRBs are providing. Sure. And from a bioethical standpoint, I would wonder um, if that translates. For example, we, we land up in a scenario where we say, oh, you know what? These processes slow us down. Why do we have them on Earth at all? Mm -hmm. So so what is your take on that? How does, do, do you think that as we start exploring space, are the, the rules we follow on Earth start changing? That's definitely a possibility. And I think that's a good point to bring up is that you know, more often than not, a lot of the um, a lot of the problems we face on Earth, as far as you know, sort of just getting things done, are because of bureaucracies that have been built up. And in the IRB is just another bureaucracy. You know, it, it started with a good intention. It started with a good, you know, ethical premise and and whatnot. But but as with many things that have been institutionalized, it now has a very bureaucratic feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, now there there are private companies that function as IRBs as well. And they tend to be a little bit more uh, faster in getting, you know, the approval done. Um, and because they have a vested interest, you know, because the researcher wants to, you know, get things going and they sort of cross all the, you know, T's and dot all the I's for you, so to speak. And I feel like um, that will be um, a better probably way or more, a more desirable way to go. So, you know, if you're a company and you're, dealing with something that has to do with biologics or some type of a treatment uh, sort of regimen and you're developing it out there in space, I feel like you will look for the shortest path to commercialization because at the end of the day, there, there's real, you know, there's money behind it, there's time, there's resources. And, it, you know, the, the people who are going to commercialize space don't have the luxury of sitting around like, you know, the, and do the glacial pace of academia, which tends to happen. And so the way I look at it is I think it should be more fast and nimble but I think there should be some oversight component as long as um, as long as it does not stagnate what is going on there, because it will be like the frontier that uh, this, the best analogy I've heard of from uh, people who understand this space better than me is it is just like when we were basically, um, you know, the, the, the in the United States back when the frontier was being explored from you know east to west and people were sort of staking their 40 acres and going for the gold rush in california and oregon and uh, there was some level of lawlessness so to speak but there was also a lot of uh, sort of pragmatic innovation that was done and the people who make made, made the shuffle, shovels and the picks were the ones who came out on top such as levi strauss so i feel like these things with regulatory bodies are important, but I think that regulatory bodies will have to loosen up the process component so that they actually just get the job done as opposed to making people get into a bottleneck. And the FAA actually, which is actually the governing body for anything going up into the atmosphere, the mm -hmm. FAA has aligned with a lot of private sector uh, companies and private sector um, momentum in order to make a lot of this facilitation happen. And sometimes what happens is you have one government agency that all of a sudden gets efficient and you may have a ripple effect from that. So what I would hope is that the FDA would get on board, you know, the uh, IRB, uh, the IRBs would get on board because I can tell you, people are not going to just wait. If someone says, okay, this is US based. Okay, fine. We'll go, go to Croatia where they don't, you know, they don't have as many regulations. Uh, China, China does their own thing, frankly, you know, and, and at some point it's going to, it's just going to become the new arms race between companies. So here's my question. Now, okay. You raised this very interesting idea of um, people will go down their own paths. I will, and, and speak, I, I have to respect the fact that I don't know much about this at uh, this moment. And I'm going to promise you that I'm going to learn a lot more very quickly because this sounds very yeah, exciting. It's, uh, it's, it's a niche space, let's put it that way. Yeah. So, so here's my question. I've always understood the International Space Station to be a very cooperative body. There, mm -hmm. there are a bunch of different countries that came together. I know China has its own, is looking at creating its own space station. I don't think it's live yet, last I, I heard. Um, but I know obviously SpaceX will probably start considering something like that as well. Mm -hmm. Do you see a future in which you have um, Kaiser Space Station and a Pfizer Space Station where they're doing clinical research or non or preclinical research mm -hmm. that's that's dedicated to them. Do you see a 
a quote unquote pharma uh, space station. Because yeah, so that's actually uh, that's actually something actively being worked on in the sense that uh, what, what's happening, what's happened over the last probably seven to eight years, probably ten years now, is that on the United States front, the uh, you know NASA, which is you know the 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 governing body essentially oh. you know for aerospace in, in the United States. What NASA has done is they, they, they've divested themselves from a lot of internal capital intensive projects and they say, well, now we're going to shift the risk. So it, it, it's a de-risking um, sort of initiative when it comes to the uh, what they're doing with public-private par- partnerships. So SpaceX is, act- SpaceX is actually the best example of this. And a, a lot of people are not aware that the only reason SpaceX actually exists and is this successful is because of significant support, both uh, financially and also intellectually, by um, you know by NASA. And and the, the way they do that is via these SBIR and SDTR grants. Mm-hmm. And what's up happening is essentially this is taxpayer money that is used for particular initiatives that are mission critical. And you know one of the mission critical things was okay, we want to bring down the the launch cost in order to facilitate, you know, cargo and other materials being sent up into the into space. Well, you know, that's been the most prohibitive part of the equation to get stuff into space is how much does it cost per kilogram, basically. So w- because of NASA's, you know, sort of infusion of capital and talent and, you know, in conjunction with SpaceX's ambition and, and, and you know, engineering prowess, what, what happens is now we have reusable rockets. So that's a huge leap. It's historic. No one's ever done this before. But but the thing is, is that this is all this is taxpayer funded innovation. But this is innovation that actually has significant ramifications. So what what I feel is, is that the more the public partnership uh, sort of scale goes to the private part, you know, the private partnership, you're going to just see more things out in space. So, for example, the ISS is set to be decommissioned in a few years. So it, it's just going to be completely taken out of, out of commission. All the countries are going to leave their partic- you know, particular modules, and essentially, uh, most likely, they're going to let it. Bur- they're going to dismantle parts of it and let it burn up, or take certain parts away. So what happens is, okay, so what do you do out in space? How do you do research? Private companies. So there are private companies that are trying to f- figure out, okay, how can we set up a lab in space? So the same way you have these smaller biotech companies in the US or abroad. So Moderna is a great, I mean, you know, um, you know, Moderna is a great example. Moderna was a, you know, a, a biotech company that had nothing to do with vaccines until all of a sudden COVID came around, right? right. That wasn't even the, what they were about. And then all of a sudden they're now focusing on vaccines and now they have one of the two FDA approved vaccines in the United States already yeah. in, in circulation. So you can imagine a company like Moderna says, you know what, we will either pay to develop a basically a low earth orbit a lab where we can test other medications, vaccines, et cetera, up there, or a third company, a, a, just a third party company, you know, like a startup will say, we will set up a lab. We'll have state of the art equipment. So it's a high capital cost, but we will, we will rent out the space and time to the rest of you pharma people. Yeah. So if you think about it from a de-risking strategy, right? So if you're Moderna, if you're Pfizer, if you're Merck, if you're all these big companies, you're like, you know what? It, it's the same mentality as acquisitions. Why should we build it when someone else can take the risk of building it? If it succeeds, we'll buy them out. Right. Right. So in space, what you can do is you essentially is is you rent your real estate, you rent your resources. And it's the same thing. You make the shovels and you make the picks and you make your fortune that way. So if anyone's out there listening and, and they're thinking like, well, how can I make a space startup? Make the startup where you can get recurring revenue. The business is not that different than the business thinking is not that different than Earth. What I think is really interesting is a lot of big pharma has actually gone the other way as well. And they've started creating um, mm-hmm. uh, the, these incubator type uh, organizations. Um, so uh, Johnson & Johnson has J-Labs, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in those scenarios, you have a bunch of pharma working, small startups working in their space. And while you talked about a third party organization where big pharma can rent space, it can go the other way as well, where big pharma creates the space and rents it out to Little Pharma. And Little Pharma develops on those sites and maybe Big Pharma gets the right of first refusal or they they don't and, and they provide just rent and um, access to innovation. So we don't really know where this will take, uh, where this will go, but here's another question. Uh, I was thinking, we've got a situation now where 
one of the largest costs you mentioned not that long ago was getting to space. Getting yeah. To space, mm -hmm. if you will. The, we've been hearing about space elevators for a long time. Uh, and the biggest problem so far has been the cost of just how do you even get the base to support the weight of the elevator as it gets into, into low, low orbit. Um, and people have been talking about um, carbon nanotubes and they've been talking about some of these other innovations. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any research done? Because the moment you get in into a situation where you can construct in low orbit and the carbon nanotubes get us there, you have true capability to not just do research, but actually start doing manufacturing and then bring sure. it back down. So has there been any consideration that you're aware of that of doing research in that context? Yeah, uh, well, the space elevator has, has been an idea that's been around for a long time, you know? And um, and it's funny because it's a, it's really a misnomer. It's not a space elevator per se. What it really is is it's it's a very high tension rope like system, like a tensile, you know, with, with a lot of uh, tensile strength to it. Well, the, the interesting thing about the space elevator idea is is that there's a lot of variable that you have to figure out how to control for. So you know the lo the regular atmosphere, any changes in atmosphere, you know how strong this cable basically is going to be. Um, yeah. Is it going to be a modular system? So does it is it like you know, are you suspending the cable via some type of a propulsion system so that it just grows onto itself as the, you know, the object that's being taken up or down, uh, you know, it, it does that. You know, others' ideas have been you, you actually start in space and you grow it down instead of on the ground and you grow it up. I, I, I personally believe that I don't think space elevators are the best way to do it. I still believe that if you can drive down launch costs to less than about $200 or 200, yeah, 200 US dollars per kilogram, if you go lower than that, you you have a, a significant pro value proposition for companies to and governments to say, okay, you know what, we're going to use this particular vendor or this, you know, launch company and send our stuff in space. The Why that number? Sorry? Why the $200? Because that's the number that's been sort of posted as, you know, that's when you, we can get an exp exponential burst of commercialization activity. Right now, I think SpaceX is roughly like maybe... Twenty five hundred or twenty seven hundred dollars per kilogram. So you know, two hundred would be an order of magnitude. Obviously, less than that. But you would have they would have to ramp up the number of launches per day to like multiple per day. And, right. and it's you know, and so that's what they're trying to scale up the, the the stuff right here. The the issue with you know manufacturing is it's probably easier to it's probably easier to be able to manufacture right in space itself. With, with actual floating factories in space and then basically send the stuff back down. So you can take, you know, maybe raw materials, certain supplies that you need, send them up there. But the other aspect of it is if you can mine other areas, so if you can mine the moon, let's say, right. if you can go to the moon and you can mine, you know, the regolith, which is the basically the soil that, that the moon has, and you can mine that and you can take out particular elements that are very, very useful for particular types of industries, then you don't have to transport it you know up and down through the the earth atmosphere you can go you can go what's called a cis lunar orbit between right. the the earth and the, the moon and you you can have a transport system like that so now you you say okay we don't really need the earth for 100 percent of our supplies right now this is obviously not going to happen overnight you know with any ecosystem it takes time to develop that ecosystem but i, I do feel like because the launch costs are coming down and because there's a significant private sector interest and push to commercialize space, I feel like it's just, that's just going to catalyze over, over the next few years. And, and there's a lot of money, $9 billion have been poured into space commercialization companies over the last few years. And I mean, it is serious money that's going in. But the uh, question is, what have we seen as a result of that $9 billion? Uh, well, one of the biggest things you've seen is SpaceX actually driving down, you know, re reusable rockets, uh, Blue Origin, you know, Jeff Bezos sort of funds it out of his own pocket in a way. But yeah. you, know, you have other companies like, you know, Virgin uh, Orbital, you know, and uh, Galactic. And, you know, they're trying to make essentially tourist like flights where you can go for five minutes of weightlessness and then you come back down, which are essentially orbital suborbital flights. And what we what we have seen from that investment is really launch technology yeah. advances. The other advances we've actually seen is what are called CubeSats. So they, these little satellites, yeah. um, you know, which is where like, for example, Starlink, you know, yeah. they're deploying thousands and thousands of satellites. And instead of 
the satellites being in what's called geosynchronous orbit, which is where the bigger satellites, the telecommunication satellites are, which are which is a much farther distance from our atmosphere. These are on the lower end of low Earth orbit, and you need thousands and thousands of them in order to basically make this blanket uh, right. around around the Earth. And that's those are the kind of technologies you're seeing more and more. Launch technology improving, CubeSats, you know, coming into play uh, for telecoms. And then you're also going to get a lot of semiconductor work done in space because of the high uh, fidelity of the work that can be done, uh, pharmaceutical, um, you know, work being done in space, fiber optics, um, and there's a few other you know categories um, that can be done. And as far as humans go, you know, for, as far as human um, sort of related research and whatnot, that will still continue. And that tends to get funded a lot by government agencies for the sake of science, you know. But but then there's this trickle down effect to say that okay, what are technologies that we can develop based off of, of that? And 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 like I said, I mean, over the last since NASA has been around for all these decades, I mean, there's tons of technologies that have come back to Earth in different forms. And and this is how it ends up happening: the government funds for the sake of science. And then a private entity comes and says, "Oh, we can package this into a product," right. and then that product ends up getting sold, and then all of a sudden the adoption increases, and now all of a sudden everybody has a smartphone. Right. You know. Um. So, e- easy question for you, Falgan, because I have several more questions I can get into, but we're already over what I thought we would take. So, um. Yeah, this is a long, a long discussion. For this <laughs> uh, how can people reach hear more about you? To find out more about this kind of stuff. Well, uh, so um, as far as me personally, um, I actually um, launched my own podcast just a little while ago called uh, "Looking Around the Corner." Um, it's on all podcast platforms on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, I use Anchor FM to populate it um, and, and and take it and you know disseminate it. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, which is same thing, looking around the corner. And um, basically, the whole point of it is is to talk to interesting people who are, you know, helping to shape our future. And a good portion of those individuals and ideas that I talk about have to do with, or are, are going to have to do with space, because we we do see a lot of technology, you know, development and implementation based on those technologies. And plus, it's an area I'm actively interested in. I have a few ideas for ventures uh, in that space, in that quote unquote space as well. Um, and I feel like um, I think more people need to hear it because um, I'm a big proponent of STEM, STEM education at a, you know especially at a very young age. And um, I, I always believe that if you if you give children the the ability to visualize themselves in a particular role or a particular um, you know in a particular uh, manner of speaking for for a career, then um, I think it's very it's it's very helpful because now you're training the next generation you know to yeah. to, to think big and and i don't really think we i don't think it's smart for us to just re- rely on the earth you know for all all that we need um because you know there are mass extinctions that happen every million so many millions of years new more and more evidence coming about that you know humans had a significant um near extinction events even thousands of years ago so i i just feel like we have an opportunity to develop this further, and and I think we should. And if they wanted to reach out to you because they have a space based um, idea that they need venture funding on or someone to connect to, how can they reach you? Yeah, uh, so I, I don't have my own VC firm or fund necessarily. I do do some angel investing, but um, I I think um, you know to the well, I mean definitely the podcast have all my contact info. I'm on LinkedIn uh, at uh, Falcon Chokshi. Um, uh, as well, and I'm on Twitter with my handle as Falcon Chalkshi MD. So all those ways, uh, I'm, you know, I'm I'm pretty um, social media savvy, I guess. <laughs> and then so I'm on them. So um, yeah, if 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 funding was uh, there is a, it is pretty capital intensive depending on what you're looking for. But um, but NASA actually has a, a good solid budget for these SBIR and STTR grants and. They will take stuff as pie in the sky as just a, a concept uh, on a white paper, and to be like, okay, I need help developing this, and they will work with you with the IP 
and and uh, to actually see, okay, is this you know can you get a prototype of a particular technology and then see if you can send it out into space, you know, on the space station for the next few years, or you know uh, they they have partnerships with SpaceX as well. So you know your product could potentially go on the next SpaceX run or one of the next ones. So, um, so some people have done that. Some scientists have done that with different things like looking at fungi and bacteria and whatnot. And then some people do it for material science, um, you know, to look at different devices, how they react in space. Uh, because there's a, there's a huge component that people don't talk about is uh, is radiation. Uh, the radiation in space is significantly stronger and more uh, more harmful to both biological tissues and um, you know, um, and non-biological mediums such as semiconductors, circuit boards, you know, these satellites, than it is on Earth. Like we're we're very fortunate to have our atmosphere and and our magnetosphere, but once you start getting out of that area, um, things get pretty hostile pretty quick. So you need to test out your stuff up there. So here's what I'm thinking. I think we need we've talked a lot a lot about research today and commercialization of research. Uh, if you're open to coming back, let's have another conversation about actual healthcare and mm -hmm. treatment and how pa patients in, um, in space get treated and what are the what are the issues that they face. Sure. Uh, you yeah. that? Awesome. Um, again, thank you for coming on, Falgun. This was- yeah, My pleasure. Thanks again. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com.